Good morning and welcome. Today we are going to look at our Sunday service. Hopefully, by way of opening here, hopefully in the near future we can all get together and meet personally um, back in the sanctuary here at Kirkland Village. And those who are not here, Lord willing, I'll be able to come and visit you in the near future. So this morning, we're going to take a look at a message I've entitled, We Love Him Because. We Love Him Because. And we're going to see the reasons as to why we can love the Lord. And the scriptures tell us a lot, both John and Paul. I'm going to take this message this morning from the epistle of First John. The epistle of 1 John, chapter 4, and I'm going to read from verse 7 to verse 19. 7 to 19. But before we do that, let's open in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you who hold the world in your hands and give breath to all living creatures, Lord, we submit to you, and we ask that this morning you would Touch our hearts, our minds. Drive away all sin, evil, illness. Lord, help us who are in the midst of this pandemic to see your grace clearer and your love clearer. That we might, we might know why we love you. And we ask these things in your most holy and precious name. Amen. This morning we're going to begin in 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading from verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. No one has ever seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we, are a, that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. The reading of God's word. You know, I entitled the message, We Love Him Because. This is really the heart of the message of the entire Bible. Um, from Genesis to the book of Revelation, God's love is manifested to you and to me. And I don't want to belabor the term love, because as I've said in other studies, 
the love of God and God's love is different in many ways than the love we seem to talk about in the world. The love in the world is based on emotion or feeling only, whereas the love of God, what we would call charity in the old King James language, that's how it's translated, has a better meaning. It is a love of action. I could say love, faith, hope, and love. Or I could say faith, hope, and charity. Charity implies doing, giving, which is, I think, a better translation, to be honest, because it tells us what we are to do. And so Jesus is the one who tells us how much God loves us. He says, or at least John records for us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I like to emphasize the word so. For God so loved the world. I believe that's how John wanted it to be read. Now, in verse 9 here of, of our passage, it says this. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Simply beautiful. In verse 10, John tells us this. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means the satisfaction, the one who accomplished and took away our sin. That too is a beautiful statement. So love in this scene is sacrificial and giving, isn't it? which is just what I was saying about how God's love should be manifested. And so God loves you. It's really quite simple. But I'd like to look at this issue here. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. Now, that's a harder thing to do, right? Because not everybody has a simple faith. What we find is that as things happen in our lives, I don't always know and believe that God loves me, especially when difficulties come. And so people kind of stagger at that idea and not all believe that God loves them. I have met many people who have given to me this idea that God is more like a stern parent or judge who doesn't smile very much and is constantly watching everything they do and every now and then is going, ah, 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 no, no, no. Ooh, I can't believe you did that. Now, if I felt like I had a God like that, I would constantly be walking on eggshells and constantly feeling defeated. But that is a false image, beloved. God does not do that. As we see, there are some people who just cannot wrap their head around the fact that God loves them. Some, somehow, they feel that if God really loved them, he would never allow them to experience pain. I mean, typically, what is our first thought when we experience pain? Oh, why are you doing this to me? Why, Lord? Or what did I do? We kind of feel that it is God's judgment upon us. And I have seen that many a time. But is it? Is it God's judgment upon us? 
I think very often of the words of that song, he whose heart is kind beyond all measure, gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. There's a whole providential, eternal salvation working out in our pain. That's what it is, mingling toil with peace and rest, right? And God knows, so he gives to each what he deems best. Uh, and this is typical in all of our suffering. None of our suffering is purposeless. The bad, uh, you know, luck or the draw of the straw, right? Um, it just happened to me. It is what it is. No. God allows nothing to come into your life and mine without allowing it to do so and allowing it for reasons that are beneficial eternally for you and for me. You know, some feel that if God really loved them, he would answer, answer all their prayers. You know, we, we pray and a lot of times we don't feel like we're getting an answer. Somebody asked the famous Oxford scholar C.S. Lewis in his life and said to him, you know, I, God doesn't hear me. He doesn't, he doesn't answer me when, you know, when I pray to him. And C.S. Lewis said to him, prayer doesn't change God. It changes me. Think about that. Prayer does change us. You see, God loves you so much, actually too much, to answer all your prayers. And think about this. You know, did you give your children everything they ever asked for? Because you knew that some of the things would not be beneficial for them if you were to give it to them, right? And the same thing with God. As I look back on my own life, uh, how deeply thankful I actually am that God did not answer all my prayers. You know, when I was young, I said, you know, Lord, I would love to have uh, this sports car and I'm working now and I'm hoping I can get that sports car. Lord, if you would just provide this for me, I promise I will go pick up all my friends and bring them to church on Sunday and I'll do this. I'll use it to the service of, of, your, of your grace, Lord. Well, he never got me the sports car. I ended up getting this old clunker of a Buick station wagon. It was a horrible color green. And every now and then when I stopped at a, at a red light, it would stall out. Embarrassing. And yet, that's what he gave me at that moment. And so, as I'm looking here, and I'm seeing God's love, I'm thankful that he didn't answer that prayer. And you want to know why? Because I'm not sure I wouldn't have had a real big ego with that sports car. I wouldn't have had a, a, a real prideful complex about me, letting everybody see me drive around in that car, showing off. Instead, he taught me humility with that green clunker that I was driving. And so we see that it was beneficial for him not to answer that prayer. And I'm sure you can think of times in your life when that may have been the case. You know, it's much like a child, as I told you, who says to his parents, if you really love me, mom, dad, you know, you'd let me have nothing but Coca-Cola at, at lunch and dinner and every day eat nothing but ice cream. Now, of course you wouldn't let him do that because if you really loved him, you wouldn't allow that. It would be bad for him or her. And some people 
I have found are so foolish as to declare that their faith in God was shattered when he didn't answer their prayer. They're not thinking this through. Your heavenly father knows what you need and knows what you're praying. But if he chooses to delay, it is for your good. We live in a day and an age now where we want everything now. We want things to be done now, uh, right away. So much so that we have, you know, microwaves in our kitchen. So instead of something that takes 30 minutes to cook in the oven, it takes three minutes in the microwave. And guess what? Three minutes seems like an eternity. We want it now. I'd rather have it in three seconds. Are we ever going to be satisfied? No. And God knows that. He teaches us patience. He taught me humility in not answering my prayer for that sports car. And he teaches us humility by making us wait patiently. He, te he teaches us patience by making us wait, trusting him to answer our prayers. You see, prayer was never intended as a means to accomplish my will here on earth, but rather God's. The purpose of prayer is to see God's will accomplished clearly. So surely not all have known the love that God has for them. Uh, we've believed God, but we've not really understood the love that he has for us. The word translated here in the Greek is gnosko, which is to know by experience. We don't know the love God has for us if we don't know that by experience. Now, what do I mean? How many times in my life have I experienced the love of God? I can remember when I worked at a delicatessen as a young, young, young man, probably about 19. And I remember working at that delicatessen and I was thinking about the Bible and some scriptures as I was cutting on the slicer some meat for a customer. And I just started talking to God a little bit under my breath as I'm, as I'm cutting that, that meat, and I began to let him know how much I love him. And for a minute, my breath was taken away. I felt his presence as if a, a, a breeze had blown right through me. And I stopped and I went, <sighs> and I smiled and felt like I just wanted to cry. And then it slowly went away. And I knew at that moment, somehow in that moment, he, he showed himself to me. He let me know he's there. And he let me feel a bit of his grace, his love. Just touched me. Almost like Moses saw God pass by him. Beautiful. And that is what I would call knowing God's love by experience. Now, that hasn't happened since. And I don't experience that every day. I wish I could. I ask him for that. But as sure as I'm sitting here with you, that occurred and confirmed to me his marvelous love by experience. Jeremiah, the prophet, wrote this in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, for great is his faithfulness. Oh, beloved, is he faithful. And his compassions do not fail. They fail not. They're new every morning. They don't fail. Paul, in describing God's love, says love never fails, especially when it's God's love. The love we have emotionally can fail. There are days I don't feel the love welling up inside of me for other people, especially when I haven't had my coffee yet. Maybe you can relate. And yet each new day does bring fresh 
demonstrations of his love. See, God is love. And that's what John tells us in this text. We, we're not sure we can believe in his love when the hard times come. We're told God loves us. But it's because he is in his very nature. Love. It's the essence of his being. And if you dwell in love, then you are dwelling in God. And God is dwelling in you. Remember what I said. This love isn't this puffy feeling or emotion all day long. It is a sacrificial love. It is a, a love of faith that believes in him. And at times it may have the emotion too where you know this love by experience. The text in the Greek for, for that is theos agapeastin, or God love is, which would be translated God is love. Now, if you dwell in love, you're dwelling in God. Let me ask you, have you ever been in love I mean, truly in love with somebody. We also use this phrase, love is blind, right? Because it's such a giddy emotion in the beginning when we fall in love with somebody. You remember those feelings? Well, see, now it's spring. And some mockingbird in my neighborhood is in love. I'm convinced because... He sings this love song all day long, right outside my window. He's in love, and that's kind of like us, right? You remember that joy you had when you first fell in love with somebody? It's all you could think about. You wanted to give and do anything and everything for that individual, you always wanted to be near them, talking to them on the phone, hanging out with them, touching them, anything, because you were in love. Do you remember how no sacrifice at all was too great to be with the one you loved? It didn't matter. You wouldn't hang out with your friends anymore. Your parents telling you you, you couldn't do this or go hang out too long. You didn't want to listen to them. You, you wanted to be in the presence of your love. You remember how fulfilling and satisfying that love was? The words of the hymn, Oh, to lie forever here, doubt and care and self-resign. While he whispers in my ear, I am his and he is mine. That should remind us, remind us of that love, right? Or the popular song of yesteryear, all that makes life seem worthwhile is in your love and the spell of your smile. It's like a spell. I can agree with that. You feel like you're under a spell. There seems to be no experience in the world that can quite match the experience of first love. The complaint, though, of Jesus to the church of Ephesus when he writes to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, he says to Ephesus that they had left their first love, talking of himself. And beloved, that is something we should constantly monitor. I wonder if he might be complaining the same thing about us. You have left your first love, which should be me. That's what he is saying. God also complained to Israel about the loss of their first love. He, he told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 2, verse 2, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord. I remember thee, the kindness of your youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou went after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. 
In Jeremiah verse chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Israel was holiness unto the Lord. So God is love, but he should be our first love. And he says, be careful, because you can lose that first love. We remember the person we first had love for and how giddy we were. And we also remember that over time, over time, that love kind of waned. But then John speaks of our love as being perfected. Now, how is your love perfected? By your dwelling in God, we're told, and God dwelling in you. And what is the result of our love being perfected? Well, we will have boldness, he says, in the day of judgment. Now, judging, now judgment fears, right? Now judgment fears, no more alarm. I dread not death nor Satan's power. The world for me has lost its charm. God's grace sustains me every hour. I am overshadowed by his mighty love. Love eternal, changeless, pure. Overshadowed by his mighty love. Rest in mine, serene, secure. He died to ransom me from sin. He lives to keep me day by day. I am overshadowed by his mighty love. Love that brightens all my way. People wrote some beautiful hymns, understanding what this love of God is. Well, how can it be that I have no fear on Judgment Day? Are you afraid of Judgment Day? It will come and we will all stand before him. And I have met some people who've said to me, Pastor, I am terrified to stand before him on Judgment Day. Well, I want to tell you two things. Number one, it's okay to allow it to be a bit scary because that just causes us to make sure we're living correctly, to make sure that we've confessed those sins to him that we've committed. But the one who loves me perfectly has taken my sins for me and for you. He paid the price for our redemption because he loves us. The experience of his perfect love for me has always cast out all the fear. And that's what we're told in the scripture. John goes on to say that perfect love casts out fear. If I know he loves me, then I know. I don't need to be afraid standing in front of him. I have no fear of the consequences of my past. God has erased it. I have no fear of the present because God loves me and is watching over me and will not allow anything to come except it be for my eternal good. Yes. I have no fear for my immediate future. Jesus has promised to be with me to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit indwells me, and thus greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. And I have no fear for my eternal future. Jesus has promised to prepare a dwelling place for me with him. And I will dwell in a house of the Lord forever, and I know that in his presence there is fullness of joy. Do you know that? That's where we're headed. So if you have fears, you have not yet been perfected in love. But we can get there by understanding his love. And finally, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And so, in the psalm, David says to us, the, I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Well, John here is declaring that we love the Lord because he first loved us. It implies action. 
It is not just a feeling which is why we might translate love charity. It means giving, it's an action, it's a sacrifice. And so our love for him is always a response once we understand the great love he has for us. I want to just do things for him. I want to let other people know about how great his love is. See, God is the initiator, and I am the responder. You and me, we respond to that love once we understand and know what it is. This is why the New Testament writer seeks to draw your attention to God's great love to you over and over. John said, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. You can almost hear John at this time, you know, contemplating that. Wow. I mean, God loves me so much. He's calling me son of God. Yes, that is exactly what he's doing. Paul said this. God manifested his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think of that. While we were yet being bad, go, uh, going in a direction away from him, not giving him any thought, he still loved us, loved us, and died for us. Really, to understand all of this about God's love is to point you to the cross so that you might see the supreme manifestation of God's love, hoping that it will find some responsive chord in your heart. And I wonder this morning if you feel that love, if you understand God's love and how different it is from the love of the world, all based on emotion. But this love is based on who he is, what we know, and how we react. This also was the desire of the songwriter who wrote this famous hymn. Looking at God and then the response, right? Understanding God's love and then the response. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did ere such love and sorrow meet our thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. You see, beloved, it is a love that reacts to a love. When we understand him, and understand who he is and what his love is toward you and me. It is then that we will say, love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. Let us pray. Father, sometimes we don't really understand what your love is. We base it on our emotions and our circumstances. And yet you transcend all of these things by giving us a love that is amazing, divine. And Lord, help us today to have a new understanding of your love and see all of our circumstances as from your hand and for our good. And in knowing this, help us, Lord, 
to give our lives, our souls, and our all to your cause and for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes we don't have a good understanding of God's love, but hopefully today we've learned a little bit more, a little bit more of who he is and how he sees you and me and what he's done for us, which should allow us to want to do for him. I pray it so, beloved. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless each of you and have a wonderful Sunday.